you. And I guess Jason said we do appreciate. We know there's a party going on, so I guess all of you are small and heterosexual, so we're glad you showed up here. Uh, so let me just set the historical context. So Austrian economics, of course, is not because we study the GDP of Vienna. It's because historically the founders of the school were Austrian. Uh, actually, in terms of the history of economic thought, the Austrian school had a prominent role to play. Uh, Karl Menger was one of the f three pioneers in what's called the subjectivist marginalist revolution, which overturned the classical labor theory of value and replaced it with the modern way that economists explain market prices. Okay, so, the, so any economist who knows the history of thought would acknowledge that Austrians were integral in, the, in that revolution in the history of economic thought. Uh, more recently, uh, Ludwig von Mises played an important role early on in integrating what we now call micro and macro theory uh, in his book, which is translated as a theory of money and credit. And so, so what Mises did is, is before the Austrians and others had realized that you use subjective valuation to explain market prices. And the, the problem was, though, that it seemed like that approach wouldn't work when it comes to money. Because it seemed like you just argue in a circle. It looked like you were saying, oh, the reason people value money is because money is valuable in the marketplace. And so it's like you're just explaining money's purchasing power by reference to money's purchasing power. So it, it looked like you were going in a big circle. Whereas with anything else, it's like, oh, why would someone give up something valuable for an apple? You say, oh, because you get utility for eating the apple. So you're explaining the price by reference to its subjective utility. So that seemed fine. But with money, it's, it just seemed like that was, it was silly because you were ultimately saying money has purchasing power because people value it because it has purchasing power. And so that seemed like a problem. So Mises walked through and showed how, no, it, it's a little bit subtle, but the standard way we explain market prices and valuation for everything else, we can apply to money also. So he kind of integrated, like I said, what we now call micro and macro theory. And then in that book, he also uh, laid the foundations of what we now call Austrian business cycle theory. So he explained how uh, banks expanding the credit supply, the money supply lowers interest rates, and that sets in motion an unsustainable boom. So that, that's some of the historical contributions of the Austrian school that any historian of economic thought would acknowledge. And then, of course, after that, uh, Mises was a champion of the free market in terms of laissez-faire policy. So that's primarily why modern libertarians tend to, if, they, if they're going to single out a school of thought, tend to look at the Austrians. And of course, uh, his follower, Murray Rothbard, is a hero to many libertarians. So just the last thing I'll say before I turn over to Dan is, to be clear, Austrian economics is what's called value-free. So it's not that Austrian economics tells me that minimum wage laws are bad. Austrian economics tells me that minimum wage laws lead to unemployment, particularly among unskilled workers. But if you just hate unskilled workers and you want them to you know, not have a job, you could be an Austrian economist and be for minimum wage laws and you'd be totally consistent in your world here, right? So it's just that the sorts of things that most civilized people care about, once you learn the teachings of Austrian economics, you tend to have a very laissez-faire outlook on in your policy thoughts, but the two, strictly speaking, are, are separate. I'm sure uh, Bob wanted to play this as though he's like old and decrepit and experienced, and the rest of us were younger and more frontline Austrian scholars and working in today's paradigm. So what I'd like to talk about is the amazing potentials that there are in the contemporary intellectual circles and, and current academic market for Austrian ideas. Um, uh, I wrote my dissertation under Pete Becky, sort of Ben Howell at uh, George Mason University, and Pete describes the history of economic science uh, of which Bob was correct in saying that Austrians have had a very significant and prominent role in the, the broader history of ideas in economic science. But um, we also spent a lot of time differentiating ourselves from mainstream economists today. But uh, an important differentiation to make is the difference between, say, mainstream economics, whatever happens to be popular at any point in time, and mainline economic thinking. Mainline economic thinking is basically just that markets freaking work, that uh, prices tend to coordinate knowledge and information, and that markets tend towards their uh, tend to flow capital to their most highly valued use. 
Austrians are very much in this main line of economic thinking. And so back in the classical period of economic science, people referred to economics not as economics at all, but as political economy. Uh, mainly that Smith's title of his book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, was an introduction, an invitation to uh, a research program that sought to explain why some countries are rich and other countries poor. That's a very big question. Why is it that so some societies prosper and other societies don't? Uh, which meant that everything was on the table for economic understanding. It didn't matter if you were talking about a pure financial pecuniary market where you bought and sold physical goods and services for pure monetary exchange, or if you were talking about the evolution of moral norms, language, customs, or legal systems. All of society was under the microscope for investigating with, uh, with say, a uh, praxeological method or uh, an understanding of rational choice behavior. And it was in the midst of the 20th century that economics really got obsessed with financial markets in the most sort of pure exchange conditions that we had to look at because it was more countable, more quantifiable. You had hard numbers. You could form, you could, you could put your understanding of human behavior in mathematical formulas and you could test implications according to statistics and econometrics. Um, however, since the, the late 1970s and the rise of global markets, the rise of, uh, of trying to think critically about the wealth and poverty of nations in today's society, why is it that significant portions of the, free, of the, of the world uh, around the globe are mired in conditions of poverty and, and, and social unrest? Those things became very critical subject matter for economists in the 80s and 90s. And, and through today, and so it, it was this ripping back open of subject matter that all of the, the, the functions of our society are now back on the table for economic inquiry. And so to some extent, it's a really great time to be young and an Austrian economist because there's so much work to be done applying these under-recognized methods in under-investigated fields. Uh, everything from development economics to, to social behavior to uh, formal and informal institutions, legal processes, all of these things are, are smorgasbords of, uh, of research opportunity for, for young motivated academics. So, uh, Anne, you're up. Tell us about the book. My name is Anne Bradley, and I was asked to be on this panel about five minutes ago, so I'm gonna wing it. I'm gonna wing it. Um, I, as well as Dan and Ben, went to George Mason to pursue economics. And actually, I only applied to George Mason for graduate school because I knew that's the type of education in economics that I wanted. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that as a graduate student strategy, but um, it worked for me. And I think I would echo a lot of what Dan said about the power of the Austrian research program to revolutionize the world, um, to change the status quo and to educate people about not only the importance of ideas, but the importance of action. So ultimately, the fundamental value is how Austrians define value, how they define choice. And so for Austrians, economics is literally the science of human action, which means all choice is economic choice. And so to have a real discussion of the distinction between economic sphere and the political sphere becomes a lot more complicated because economic life is so ubiquitous. And so I think what's important and probably part of why you all are here is because you think ideas matter and you think that we're headed down a bad path right now. And I think Austrian economics provides an important paradigm for how to change the world and how to influence ideas. To know that incentives matter, to know that um, I think you know the public choice um, research program along with the Austrian program are powerful tools. Um, I did my graduate uh, dissertation on economics of terrorism, and so just like what Dan was saying, um, I think Austria provides a rich research program for trying to analyze current real world problems and how we might think about those, because it takes it all the way down to its beginning. 
how is choice manufactured? How do people make decisions? And how is value um, conveyed across a group of people? So I think that it's an exciting time for Austrian economics. I think that um, it's important to understand it, to understand its authors, and to understand the power of ideas that it provides going forward. And I think what the world needs is really good articulators of those ideas. So it's not just enough to believe it, but it's about convincing people that these this research program is powerful and helps us understand how humans act. And it helps us understand Adam Smith's question, which was raised over 200 years ago, which is why are some nations rich and some poor? And we still have that question. I think theoretically it's um, easier to answer than practically. So I think the Austrian research program provides us powerful tools for how we're really going to get to human flourishing if that's what we care about. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Ben. All right. So there was a, a history of the libertarian movement in the 1960s. It was called It Usually Begins with Ayn Rand. Uh, maybe some of you have seen it as a great little book. If there was gonna, one going to be written over for the last decade of libertarianism, it would clearly be, it usually begins with Ron Paul. That's what brings most people to libertarianism today, and for that matter, in particular, to Austrian economics today. Uh, as a result, a lot of the people equate Austrian economics with ending the Fed, which, don't get me wrong, I'm all with you, let's abolish that beast. Uh, but at the same time, Austrian economics is something much broader than that. Uh, so when I think of Austrian economics, I think of four or five kind of core tenets that makes one an Austrian economist. Uh, knowing that economic theory is a priority, so it's deduced from first principles, it's not subject directly to empirical testing. So it gives Mises a split between theory and history, so I guess that would be the second tenet, the splitting of theory and history. And, but also at the same time, Austrians a lot of times, uh, particularly new people getting into it, start to think, Oh, well, that means Austrian economists, we must just do a new theory of this. And frankly, you know, for uh, the last 20 years, it's hard to find very many articles, I think, that did a new Austrian theory of anything that was of any much value. A few here and there. But most of the time, most good economists work, including Austrian economists, is in the realm of what Mises called history. Murray Rothbard, one of my heroes, a great deal of what his work was, was in applied theory, or what Mises would call history. Uh, another tenet of Austrian economics that I think would be subjective value, and actually with the caveat, and really mean it. Because you ask any economist, do you believe in subjective value? And they say, of course. But then you pay attention to what they're doing and they violate it 16 times. Um, after that, competition is a process, not an end state, so understanding the dynamic rivalrous process of the market. Uh, followed up by socialist economic calculation is impossible, and this isn't just beating a dead horse. It has important implications for understanding policy today, whether it's national economic development policy, whether it's public goods policy, uh, or even applications to externalities where people would otherwise violate our, uh, advocate market interventions. Uh, and maybe Austrian business cycle theory, I certainly think it's very important, but I don't know if it's a core tenet that makes one an Austrian or not. There's plenty of people who I think are Austrian economists who have reservations about business cycle theory. Uh, which is fine because in my world there's two types of economics, micro and macro, and micro is the equivalent of non-fiction and macro is the equivalent of fiction. <laughs> uh, which incidentally, by the way, is why I like Austrian business cycle theory, because as Bob mentioned, it merged micro and macro so that it's micro foundations to explain macroeconomic phenomena. Um, I think the point that Dan raised is a good one about mainline versus mainstream, and one that Pete Betke uh, often brings up. Uh, and that Austrian economics, as I described it, those, those core kind of five tenets, you could say lots of those things, and if I was talking to a mainstream economist, they'd say, well, yeah, mainstream economists believe that. that. What they don't do is they don't believe the package of it, and they're not consistent. And this is partly, I think, the evolution of the history of economics of Austrian as being firmly within the main line. But what we see at the mainstream at any given time deviating greatly from that from moment to moment. Um, so I think I'll finish up by talking about just a few things, because Dan was foreshadowing the uh, Austrian economics today and what one can do. Uh, I, I teach at Suffolk University in Boston. We have a PhD program there. And I uh, get a lot of students who come there who are interested in working in Austrian economics. And uh, they're not working on just end the Fed or something like that. Just to give you a flavor for Austrian projects that they're doing, that they're able to publish in mainstream economics journals and then go on and get tenure-track jobs at other universities. Austrian economics is not a dead-end career path for those people who are interested in it. It's one that can be quite fruitful.
school. So one that I just had graduate this year, she was working on uh, caste as a self-enforcement mechanism in 19th century India. It's pretty cool. Her first dissertation chapter showed that basically an indigenous banking caste existed outside of the colonial government. The colonial government wouldn't recognize any of the contracts that they did, and how they used internal self-governing mechanisms in order to enforce contracts and have a multi-million dollar banking system that ranged over all of Southeast Asia. So strong implications for anarchist libertarian type of arguments about how to enforce contracts without government. And then, her second part of it, was how did their banking system actually work? And she finds that it relates to Kevin Dow's theory of uh, bankers' laws. And that it was a self-equilibrating free banking system, basically, that operated fairly well and fairly stable. And then, actually, this weighs in on the last part of what she was working on. Uh, the debates that some people who are interested in Austrian economics have about the gold standard. Uh, she looked at how did they operate without any government interference, and she finds that they were a fractional reserve-based system that was still stable i.e. you don't need a 100% reserve system to be stable, competition can do it, and was doing it in that instance. Another guy I had working with me who graduated, she got a job at College or Charleston, a great tenure track job down there. Um, another guy I had working with me this year was reinterpreting India's development history. Uh, so he finds that uh, supposed free market economist of uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, Deepak Lal, uh, guys who are Mont Pelerin Society members and kind of mostly free market, but then status on occasion or frequent occasion. Um, they and their students all kind of give like a free pass to India. The first 10 years of development planning, or socialist national economic planning, they say all of that worked pretty well. It was just later, it was incentives and public choice reasons that dragged the place down. What he goes through is to say, no, they don't understand much game calculation problems here. What they're measuring is, hey, the economy was increasing, the GDP was rising. So that just forced industrialization a la Stalin. And he shows that what they were doing was they were just propping up all of the, uh, the uh, big heavy industry, but it didn't translate it into any real consumer improvements in standards of living for the masses. Uh, furthermore, then he looks on the rest of Indian development history. And India's been doing great the last 20 years. I mean, they're still dirt poor in many places. But explosive growth, largely related to the liberalization that happened in the early 1990s. And some uh, of our least fit economists, like a Brad Duong, uh, points out that, hey, in the 1980s, India started growing faster, so it couldn't have been liberalization that did it. It comes in again with Austrian insights and calculation, showing there wasn't real consumer satisfying economic growth in the 80s. It only came later, in the 1990s and 2000s, after you got liberalization. I've got another guy working on Austrian business cycle theory right now, uh, in an important extension of it that's never been done and long overdue. Austrian business cycle theory was developed in the context of a domestic economy with a gold standard. So he's working for an international economy and fiat currencies and how transmission mechanisms go around the world, which would kind of be relevant with what went on the last like seven or eight years here. All of this stuff is acceptable to mainstream economists when you don't write, this is an Austrian theory of X that's only applicable to Austria. What you do is you take something interesting in the world, you're like, hey, here are these ideas that explain what was going on. It just so happens it comes from a guy named BC's Rothbard, whoever. And then they're like, oh, okay, that's acceptable. So I think the future is right for Austrian economics in the academy. And I think as it teaches us important lessons about how the free markets operate and make the world a better place, if uh, we don't manage to drool all over ourselves, we can go on TV and radio in a reasonable way. I think uh, you know, it helps everybody else understand some of the benefits of the free society as well. Um, so at this point, I think unless somebody else wants to follow up, we can open up to questions about anything and everything Austrian economics. Yeah, so I, I think it works probably better if you guys come up to the mic because then you don't have to repeat the, the question. Uh, let me ask the first one to you guys, since you guys all got jobs coming out of GMU. What, did you guys, were you like on your resume or CV, were you an Austrian economist or were you somebody who dabbled in spontaneous order and Eskimo bat, rap battles and such? <laughs> what was the last one, Eskimo rabbits and such? That, that's my research program. They oh. were not usually exclusive. Um, I, I mean, uh, like Ben said, I did not necessarily title my dissertation or nor do I have papers that begin with an Austrian approach to X, Y, or Z, but several of the journals that I had published in had, had Austrian in their title. Uh, I, I, I won uh, a dissertation award for best dissertation in Austrian economics. Um, my field examination in graduate school was in Austrian economics, and many of the institutional affiliations, such as the Mises Institute, Institute for Humane Studies, Foundation for Economic Education, etc., I certainly did not censor 
my CV to go on the job market. Um, and I think that this is something that gets propagated to a lot of strategic, career-oriented academics that you have to hide not only your Austrian identity with your libertarian identity in order to succeed in the academy. And I simply reject that theory. Uh, there's very few to no success stories that you can point to someone and say, see, they hid who they were, did conventional research for a decade, then like ripped open their shirt like Superman and said, aha, I'm here, I'm really a libertarian, and now I change all my views now that I have uh, tenure or an academic appointment. Instead, there's a lot of success to be made being just open about who you are and what your beliefs are. And I'd, I'll even go so far as to say that I think more uh, smaller scale institutions like teaching institutions care uh, or at least value uh, an open identity in terms of ideology. Uh, if you have a, a very career-based strategic uh, person as a faculty member, you as a student are an obstacle to their research. You're a, a, a waste of their time. When you have a crazy market capitalist like me, you're an input into my vision of social change. So I want you to be convinced and compelled by the arguments that I present. So I care about what your opinion is when you leave, leave my class. I'd rather learn from an extreme Marxist or an extreme Keynesian than someone who is there to simply like convey the information in the textbook and not necessarily uh, be convinced by the material that they're learning. And I think the same is true for libertarian scholars. And that's becoming recognized more and more in the academy. Uh, so, like Dan, I've never run away from the word Austria in the least. Although I will say, broadly, if someone asks me what I am, I consider myself an economist, uh, first and foremost. And I think everything I do is consistent with Austrian economics, but I don't think everything I do is obviously and explicitly only Austrian economics. Um, but that said, I've never run away from the label or that I, when I said the Austrian theory or whatever, it's usually more commentary on the article to follow than Austrian. I uh, put Austrian in the title of things before and, and published in other journals. I really don't detect, in terms of the economics of the profession, I'm strong or much any, any bias against Austrian economics. There's some people who will be, but there's other people who will be interested in you specifically because that's the type of work you do. On net, I don't really think there's a, a bias against it. I encourage everyone to embrace it. like that. There's some uh, libertarian institutions that encourage people to do the stealth strategy. I don't know a single example of someone who's pretended to be not libertarian, who actually, by the way, is libertarian. Most of the people who do that strategy have like some soft, poor, weak-ass libertarian beliefs to start with. They really want to come through in their research anyway. Uh, so maybe it's not so bad that they're doing the stealth strategy. They can stealth their way out of existence. <laughs> When I was first year, when Ben and I were in the same class at George Mason, uh, we had a Chicago economist who was teaching our uh, micro class. It was the first class of the first semester of your graduate school career. It is intimidating. And we had to write a paper for the class. And my idea, I was toying between the two, and I went to this professor and I said, you know, so one of my ideas is to write about infomercials and how they kind of you know, help people test market demand, etc. But the other idea I have is to write about the market for selling babies. And I mean, I'm not kidding. He looked at me like I was insane. That's a crazy question. If he actually told me, I'm a first year. Okay, he told me if you write that and you have that title anywhere on your CV, you will never get hired. Now I didn't go into the academic job market when I finished graduate school, but this was his big concern. And I did it anyway. I mean, I think that his um, advice pushed me in the opposite direction, so I went for it because I thought it was a legitimate question to think about um, how that would change the market. And so I think, um, I, I you know, fly my flag proudly, but I, and I, people I know from George Mason do the same thing, but I think, um, yeah, I didn't feel like I ever had a high head in any way. Yeah, and it's true, Anne didn't get an academic job, but since then she sold eight babies, and so... <laughs> About anything, applications of Austrian economics, the current business cycle, economics generally, let's go. All right, uh, we got a couple of you. Hey, Mark. Hey, Ben, good to see you. Um, 
So, I was having this discussion with my business partner uh, slash co-host the other night and on the air, and he wanted, you know, I, I said that economies in large com countries seem to do better than economies in small countries, and it blew him the F up. Like, you can't, that can't be true. So, why is it that economies in large countries tend to do better than economies in small countries, or is this, um, you know, I've read a book, the, the economies of big countries. Tell, tell me about that. I reject it, it's wrong. Uh, so Hong Kong, Singapore, two of the wealthiest in the world, they're small countries. Russia's pretty big, it kind of sucks. Uh, I don't see a, a, a tight relationship here at all. I mean, I mean that's a very casual one, here's some off, off the top of my head, but I've never, to my knowledge, seen a paper that actually shows this. Causation and correlation is also problematic here. I mean, when, you're, when, you're, when you have a vibrant economy, you're going to be attracting immigrants. And so your country's going to be larger uh, over time with the vibrant economy. And if you're inversely screwing up your economy, you're going to leave. So to the extent that you're observing, well, there are some countries that are very large and they're doing very well, I would ask, which came first? Uh, was it necessarily humongous population that led to vibrant economies, or was it necessarily vibrant economies that led to larger populations? So actually, following up on this, to be a little bit nicer. The reason I don't think there's a relationship between size of country and it is crucially dependent on how well integrated the economy is internationally. So if you're a small place and you're well integrated internationally, you get the benefits of the division of labor around the world. If you're a small economy and you're not well integrated, then you're going to suck to specialization and division of labor within the weather, except the world. Same thing if you're a big place. Well, then. So actually, if I think of the United States in the 19th century, that it was a fairly high growth time, and while we had a lot of protectionist tariffs, but it was a pretty big economy with a lot of immigration, so we're getting a lot of the benefits from that to offset it. So I think that's probably where it might Thank you. Anyone else? So you want to come? Uh, I reminded many years ago it was too difficult. <laughs> um, the questions are, are we really free now because of the relationship between the 1% and the 90%? Are we free now because of the national debt? I asked the questions part of the I don't, what are you asking? Can we, are, are our, are we more, for lack of a better word, captive to the government's wishes because of the high debt burden that we're carrying now? Or, uh, or how do we get rid of the national debt to give us ourselves more security in mind, even if we might not give us more physical security? And the other one is, is that 1%. ideological commitments to liberty have done a very good favor for human society. In, in the 18th century, the 19th century, it was sufficient to say, God gave me my rights, get off my lawn, because I said so. Um, in today's terms, I don't think that that suffices to promote the types of liberty and freedom that are most important to wealth creation and a developed society. So one question to ask is how free are we? How free are we? Another question to ask is how wealthy are we? And in real wealth terms, compared to human existence and compared to the globe, we're incredibly wealthy. And the convenient part about that is that wealth buys you a very large amount of liberty um, to a certain extent. The, the forms of debt and government intervention that we've experienced in the 20th century, I think, threaten that scope of wealth. But I took economic history in graduate school with an economic historian by the name of John Nye, and he put it really simply. He said, it's really easy to be a totalitarian when the average age of the population is about 17, and they're starving to death. And the only people who are over 35 are endowed with religious notions of government legitimacy. Fast forward time a little bit, empower an industrial revolution, raise the age of 
the average citizen and the amount of real physical wealth that they have in their disposal, it's a lot more difficult to push that population around through a totalitarian regime. So in, in a very real sense, I think that the, one of the best shields of, of, of losing liberty is economic wealth creation. I'm not sure how much that specifically answers your question. But th those are my sort of thoughts on those topics. So, so two thoughts related to this. First, I don't know about the 1%, I don't care about that. The problem is the one in a million. It's the 360 some odd people in Congress versus the 300 million here and the fact that they control $3 trillion worth of spending. That's what I worry about. That relates to your other question, which is the debt issue. Uh, how do we get out of this? And I think the uh, uh, economist Jeff Hummel, uh, who actually some of you might know from a history hero of the Civil War, Emancipating Slaves and Slaving Free Men, uh, excellent book. Uh, he's also an, uh, an economist. And uh, he, for a long time now, has been predicting uh, repudiation and default on the debt, and also advocating it. And I've come to believe that that wouldn't be a bad thing either, uh, on moral or on economic grounds necessarily. Certainly in the short run, it will cause a mess in the financial markets and give you a nasty business cycle. But morally, let's start with that part. So there's people who voluntarily lend the federal government money. It sounds like if the government's going to go bankrupt, which it is, we're approaching 100% debt to GDP level and racking up a trillion, more than a trillion dollars of new debt every year. Excuse me, I said we. I misspoke. The U.S. government is racking up. More than <laughs> So it will hit a spot where it's got to default. I mean, when I ask a freshman class, how many of you expect us to collect Social Security? No one thinks yes. Well, hell, on moral grounds, I think Social Security recipients are entitled to their money before people voluntarily lend the government money. It seems like those should be the last legitimate claim holders. So I'd be in favor of repudiation on those grounds alone. But second, if you want a balanced budget amendment with teeth, how about a straight out repudiation? That'll make it hard for the federal government to get money again. If it has to Um, as scholars, what drew you to Austrian economics over another free school, um, sorry, free market school such as Chicago or something like that? Um, as scholars, what drew you to Austrian economics over another school such as uh, Chicago or something like that? My experience on that is, is just really straightforward: is, uh, is mentorship. I went to undergrad and studied under Walter Block and then sort of turned over to graduate school at George Mason. So I refer to myself as sort of a hydroponic libertarian. I was very much grown in house. Um, and uh, I, I think that this is actually something that, that the libertarian academic community is actually very, very good at um, uh, promoting uh, talented young scholars when, when they're discovered and supporting them throughout the process. Um, it, I, I lecture in the summers for an organization called the Institute for Humane Studies that any of the young people uh, attending should definitely look into signing up for. But typically at the end of those conferences, we refer to a, a concept called the Libertarian Favor Bank, where you withdraw when you're young and you deposit when you're old. And I, I, I want to loosen the definition of young so that I can continue to withdraw, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, significant aspect in, in my career. Uh, uh, I think the, the reason I was drawn more to the Austrian school is I, I read Milton Friedman before I read like Mises, and of course I love Friedman's stuff and the book Free to Choose and things like that. Uh, but it seemed to me that the real hardcore libertarian type Austrians were more consistent. So it was like, yeah, I, I can understand with Friedman why you would want to have medical licensing laws that seem silly and inefficient, blah, blah, blah. But then, you know, reading Murray Rothbard about why you don't need to have a central bank and, and so forth, that to me it just seemed like uh, it, it was a more consistent application of, of that worldview. Like Bob, actually, uh, Milton Friedman was a gateway drug for me. Uh, I didn't have a, an undergrad professor, and I actually just caught a book when I was at a conference. They literally like threw it into the stand. And I read Milton Friedman, but then I found out Hayek was his colleague. I read Hayek, I read Mises, and just kind of got dragged down that road. By the way, speaking of Friedman, his uh, longtime co-author, Anna Schwartz, died the other day. Uh, and she was hardcore to the end and outspoken against the recession that was going on in the Federal Reserve and calling them inflationary messes. So, shout out to her. How many of you had ever even heard of her before you said that? Okay, just wondering. 
Hey, I'm, uh, I'm interested what you all think of Bitcoin, uh, especially, especially compared to uh, commodities like gold. Um, it's questions about Bitcoin. Uh, it's I dabble. I mean, I'm, I'm by no means an expert. I think I understand some of the the math behind it. So my my conclusion from that is Bitcoin is if, if everyone embraced it, it would be really good for what its main function should be is that you can't counterfeit it. So even you know governments with supercomputers and stuff, they couldn't uh, crack that or it'd be very expensive to take along. It wouldn't be worth their effort to bother trying to inflate that. Um, I think though that. Like people who'd say, "Well, oh, this is the way." Like, if they, if we did this, if people embraced it, then uh, you know, the government couldn't stop. We could do all kinds of black market things. I think if if I turned to the dark side and I were advising the government, I could figure out ways to to punish people who are doing using Bitcoin to do otherwise illegal things. So I don't think Bitcoin would would change the world in terms of like making governments impotent. Uh, I think though it, it would really help in terms of monetary. Uh, integrity. So, like, it would take away the government's ability to inflate if everyone started using Bitcoin. But I don't think that, you know, they, they, we would be able to do all kinds of other stuff and they would have no way to stop us. I think they would still be able to, you know, waterboard you with things. And the fact that you were using Bitcoin wouldn't give you oxygen. So, Bob mentioned in his preliminary comments that the history of Austrian thought is very much uh, centered and tied around Mises' theory of money and credit, which synthesized the quantity theory of money um, with broader theories of macro and, and, and microeconomics. Um, and I, I think that there are two significant interesting currency phenomena in today's society that update uh, that theoretical uh, debate. One is Bitcoin and the other is what's going on in Somalia. Uh, with regard to Bitcoin, it uh, presents an interesting issue regarding what we consider to be a commodity. Uh, Bitcoin seems to have value for its function as an anonymous means of exchange. Mainly that you can hide who you are and participate in exchange and transactions that cannot be tracked by government authority, uh, which is obviously a product of prohibition regimes, but a uh, very interesting functional aspect of, of exchange currencies. The second one with regard to the Somali shillings, uh, they're, they're trading at the comparable value of paper in their economy. The, the, the government collapsed. People still use, I mean, it would be like if the United States government collapsed tomorrow, but people continue to trade fractional reserve notes, but fractional reserve notes were worth no more than a sheet of paper of comparable size. That's essentially what's happening with the Somali shilling. So the fact that people still use them as currency is a, is a testament to the power of culture about how conditioned we become to, to using particular currencies. Um, whereas Bitcoins uh, re-emphasize the sort of functional logistic value of certain uh, technological forms of trade. So I, I'm no computer programmer. If I, the day that there's a Dan D'Amico digital currency out, rest assured that I have like a back door and can inflate it for my own personal benefit. Um, so that's sort of like all I say regarding I appreciate you uh, coming here and, ask, and uh, answering our questions. What I want to know is what's going to happen with student loans and uh, what's going to replace, immediately, immediately replace uh, the FRMs as national and international uh, reserve currency. <clears throat> what's going to happen with student loans isn't like an economics question, it's a political question what they got to do with it. Either a bunch of kids who've got sociology degrees who shouldn't are going to have to repay them or really have a hard time repaying them, or uh, they'll continue to subsidize the interest rate. I, I don't have any idea. politics is going to go with the Bob. If we were sitting there, we could have let it run out, and it would have never been As far as the other, you, you were asking about what would replace the dollar as reserve currency. Again, um, we don't know, but I, I, my guess is going to be that the, the euro and some, you know, will collapse, and then at some point the, the same thing will happen to the dollar, and everyone will be shocked. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is inconceivable. And um, and then they will have some sort of like IMF issued thing 
that they will initially have to have backed up by gold or some sort of commodity basket. I think that's the way they would get people to be relieved and, and go to this other thing at least temporarily. I mean, I could imagine also, I don't know why the Chinese don't back their currency with gold for a while and get the whole world using it and then say, huh, surprise, we're going to not do it anymore, just like Nixon did. That, that's what I would do if I were them. A lot of these things, I, I, I really sometimes think I should just go be a statist because I think that they... <laughs> anyway, afterwards, just come talk and I have some other ideas that I hope they don't think of. Um, yeah, I'd just like to uh, reiterate the uh, former guy. Uh, this is very, very interesting. Um, I've never, um, I've never uh, been exposed to the Austrian perspective on uh, empiricism and how I, uh, how I see the world, how any reasonable person uh, can interpret the world uh, honestly and truthfully is that the effects of government uh, lead to uh, bad consequences, negative consequences. Um, that's, that's an empirical uh, understanding of the world. And uh, I, I was just uh, curious as to uh, the place empiricism holds uh, for Austrian economists, um, or if it's uh, reserved for an entirely different, different context altogether. So I'll start us off with this, I guess. It, empirical work is very important for Austrian economics. Uh, one, to illustrate the power of the theories. Uh, if you don't, people really don't tend to believe abstract theory. Uh, but beyond that, where do you get your ideas for abstract theory from? So there's plenty of a priori theories that you can start constructing. You can have your non-Euclidean or on the tree. You can also have your asinine economics where uh, demand curves slope upward. Uh, where we get the basis for starting theories would be, I mean, so uh, Rothbard actually considers it broadly empirical, uh, the basis for Austrian economics even. But like what gives you your ideas about what you want to theorize about does have something to go on with what's going on in the world around you. Uh, but at the same time, the world's a complex place and you can't isolate any effects without theory. And what Austrian economics is really good at doing, I think, is making explicit what, or actually economics in general is good at this, but particularly Austrian economics making explicit what are your theoretical assumptions for deciding what are the quote, facts of the world around you. Because absent theory, there's no dividing line between facts and noise. Yeah, just to, to clarify on that, I mean, there's some self-described Austrians take that a bit far, and they, they make it look like the position's more radical than it is. So on the one extreme, you, it's silly when, when positivists say, uh, you know, oh, I let the data speak for themselves. I don't, and it, it is plural. Don't say I let the data speak for itself or you can't have the conversation anymore. Um, right, so they say, oh, you know, I don't go in with my preconceived notion like you ideological Austrians, it's just religion to you. And, and that's, that's a silly thing to say because if you want to say, oh, like, why did the stock market crash in 1929? And you say, oh, I don't have any preconceptions, I just go look at the data and see what, it's, what the data say. Well, you don't go look and see, you know, where was Pluto in 1928 or something, you know what I mean? Or you don't say what was the, you know, the vegetation level like in Bangladesh or something, you know what I mean? Like there's, you already have a good idea of what sorts of things might be relevant to that question. So whether you realize it or not, you're already going in with, the, with an a priori theory. It's just you're making a dividing line sooner rather than later. And then on the other hand, for Austrians too, I mean, it, what we mean when we say we have a priori theory that we don't use empirical tests to determine the validity of the theory, we mean that the, the theoretical explanation and to, to conclude other things equal this thing will lead to this result. We mean that cause and effect relationship isn't something you go look at history to determine. But for example, if we want to say, uh, oh, geez, why is the economy so bad the last few years? It's, it's one thing to say, well, most Austrians would not say, oh, it's because they raised the minimum wage law, and that's really the explanation for the worldwide catastrophe, even though, you know, we do have an a priori theory to explain if you raise minimum wage laws, it will lead to these problems and cause unemployment, but you see, you can know that cause and effect qualitative relationship, but still think, using my judgment, looking at how awful the world has been, looking at the relatively minor increase in the minimum wage law that did in fact occur, I don't think that's really the explanation for what's going on. All right? Or another example, I mean, I've been really worried since Bernanke's been doing his crazy stuff about price inflation, and I foolishly got sucked into making some bets that now Steve Chapman just recently referred to my bet that I'm probably going to lose. I'm like starting a sinking fund to pay off all these people that I bet about inflation. And, um, you know, so there too, I mean, it's, 
If I lose those bets, it's not that Austrian business cycle theory is wrong or monetary theory is wrong. It's just my judgment was off in applying it if I if I lose those bets. You see, so it's it is a complex thing in terms of knowing how to apply the theory, the cause and effect relationship. That that thing by itself, you know, is airtight as long as your deductive reasoning has been correct. Taking time out of your I'm going to ask you something that borders on the political, but it does tie into the economic. As it relates to tax policy in the United States, I know, say in Estonia, they have a flat tax, and that works very well for them. Their economy is the only, one of the only ones growing in the Eurozone. Do you think that tax reform, like a flat tax, or like the uh, fair tax, do you think that's a distraction to overall spending? I guess I see a lot of things about the broker more quest plays and more and more Republicans are rejecting that. Do you think this whole thing is just something that's just a, do you think tax reform in general is just a distraction? Because I feel like if you're not cutting the spending, then what the hell does it matter how you're taxing people? So do you think that's just an overall distraction to people? Yeah, sure. I think that's great. You're already starting to get in the applause to answer your question. Uh, I was on a panel at CPAC this year. It was on tax, and Norquist was on it too. And uh, I don't know, I don't probably would go over bigger in this room, but I basically said what you did there. And actually, other than fair tax, I hate the freaking name because there's no such thing as a fair robbery. Uh, <laughs> because I don't need just the love from you guys. I have no self-esteem. Um, I, I, believe me, I understand what you're saying, and yes, it is true that ultimately, you know, any, any government spending redirects resources out of the private sector into political channels, and, and in that sense, it's, it's bad. I mean, you would, it wouldn't matter what the tax, well, it would matter, but you wouldn't, there would be no political reason to have a punitive tax system if government spending were real low because the citizens thought that, oh, that's not the proper role for the federal government to be dabbling in X, Y, and Z. So, so that's all true. On the other hand, though, I have done a lot of work in the tax area, and it is, it's astonishing just how stupid the tax code is. In other words, it, it makes me more cynical about the government because it's not, it's not simply that, oh, geez, they want to take a bunch of our money. They could take more of our money and we would have more left over if they had a more sensible tax code. So what that tells me is the point isn't merely that, oh, they want to spend a bunch and so they have to get it. It's that the tax code per se gives them power over people. Like that that's how, uh, you know, the, the filthy rich people, but think about it. If you're a Rockefeller or something back in the day, you would be for the income tax because that's the way to keep everybody else from challenging your dynasty. You know what I mean? Like you can set your grandkids up because you know any other family that tries to get up there is going to get kneecapped every generation with the estate tax or whatever. So that's my more conspiratorial take on it. So in that respect, I don't think we should just focus on spending, but I think the tax code per se is, is pernicious. And even, let me just give you one example. If the tax code were 100%, revenue would be basically zero, but you wouldn't then conclude, oh, so it's not really hurting the economy because they're not taking resources. No, that would be devastating to come. Everything would be underground and be terrible. Hard on them. There were some libertarians that are sort of sympathetic. On the first question, I think it depends what you mean by artificial. Um, if you mean that like fractional reserve practices will always and everywhere induce uh, manipulation of the capital market that ends in a problematic reallocation, I don't think that's necessarily true, as is demonstrated by say the Indian example that Ben pointed out, uh, or the history of free banking practices. The, the major concern, I think, for uh, promoting stable economies with our current banking system is with regard to central banking authority as opposed to competitive banking practices, not necessarily commodity reserve systems as opposed to uh, fiat systems. So a lot of, some Austrians are very much wedded to gold standards, uh, I'm more of a fan of free banking practices. Um, on the second question, which was Coase and Demsetz's theory of property rights as opposed to HAPA, uh, I'm a fan of Coase and Demsetz. Uh, 
I, I definitely do not think that either is like a, a, a critical threat to the tradition of property rights as my esteemed colleague Walter Block and I debate every day. <laughs> I don't think you might to be honest with you, the first 10 minutes to take up stuff on the phone. It's a long day. Um, that's kind of cool. Um, so if you did already experience, uh, say what I'm about to ask you, go ahead and feel free to gloss over it. But for those of us who don't have the luxury of going to Auburn, Alabama, or up to the GMU or anything like that, we're still really interested in watching economics as far as academia goes. Um, I'm from Michigan, it's mostly very no entrepreneurial school there before I can understand like, you know, how much it is. Doctor, but anyways, um, what would you recommend to somebody who does want to look at that game in the Austrian discipline, uh, but doesn't really have much in the line of resources as far as professorship or anything that goes, and also much pictures? Uh, uh, so I might let I, I might let Murph comment about Austrian economics or in Michigan, um, but uh, in general about pursuing to try to get an academic career. Uh, actually, my advice would be if you're not already willing to, to move somewhere to get a graduate degree, you shouldn't bother entering academia because once you get your PhD, it's a national or international job market anyway. And if you're not willing to move to anywhere in order to be successful, you'll end up uh, in a broom closet somewhere. And or if you get your degree on the internet, you can also end up in the broom closet. <laughs> Oh, no, and by the way, so I don't want to be a, uh, at all, at, so I do a lot of public intellectual work, writing for newspapers, for internet websites, for media, television, radio, and stuff. But Bob and Dan have both done a lot of this, too. We have started to do some of it at earlier job. So I'm a big fan. I don't mean to be, you have to have an academic career. I thought the question was, if you want an academic career, that's what you got to be willing to do. Yeah, also, I don't... Um, you, it's, it's easier now to, to go get a conventional economics PhD somewhere and do Austrian stuff on the side, you know what I mean? So, like, I went through NYU's program, and it's true, I was there was an Austrian fellowship, and so that's who was paying for me to be there. But I mean, my pro, my courses, it's not like I learned even public choice. It was all straight me, neo Keynes, new Keynesian models, and things like that. And you know, what would the public, you know, what would the central planner do in this situation? You know, that kind of stuff. So it, it's my dissertation. It's true, was Austrian, but that's that's what I wanted to be. So you can, there's plenty of things where you can learn your Austrian stuff and then just get a conventional degree if that's the way you want to go. I mean, it'll be harder for you to, to maybe get a job that's Austrian friendly. If you want to do that, I would say GMU is probably the, the best thing still, but um, it's, it's not as crucial now with, with the internet and all the online things you can do and go to conferences on your spare time. You don't have to have your committee chairman being a hardcore Austrian. That, that's not as essential now. The, the last point of comment on this is simply the fact that there has never been more formal financial support for explicitly Austrian or libertarian scholarship in the, the formal academic sector than there is right now. Um, I mean, we're all very relatively young as far as academic careers is concerned. And even now, compared to when we were all doing graduate careers, there are significant multiple times over more resources, everything from independent uh, essay contests to uh, explicit scholarships, summer conferences, networking opportunities, uh, I mean, everything from the Institute for Humane Studies, Ludwig von Mises Institute, Foundation for Economic Education, uh, all independent uh, institute, all of these organizations have both educational opportunities affiliated scholars, I mean, there's a, a network of, acad of credentialed academic and professional Austrian economists ready, willing, and able to help young people enter this profession and be a part of its research environment. Um, and it's more so than uh, any of the sort of heroes in the Austrian movement who people look up to and read and admire had at their disposal. So uh, that's something to sort of keep in mind, that if at a fraction of the resources, the people who you read and, and admire were capable of producing what they produced, well, what is it that you can really produce with significantly more resources at your disposal? Just a quick question. Uh, since the Fed is determined to keep interest rates low for the next few years, what would you uh, think of concrete 
talking about that we are in a bond bubble now. And what, when do you think interest rates will start to move up in the U.S.? In the future. <laughs> This is the kind of thing where I've been wrong, so I'm kind of gun shy now because I publicly on my blog people are like, okay, you're pessimistic when, and so I say, well, at this point, and then it doesn't happen. I look like an idiot. Uh, but I think there is a bond. I mean, just last year, the latest figure I saw is that the Federal Reserve bought 77 percent of the net debt issued by the Treasury. Right? You know what that means? So, in other words, Uncle Sam spent more than took in. And all that gap, 77% was lent effectively by the Fed because they took that, those bonds and on their books. So in the limit, oh, you're against that? Okay. Um, in, the, in the limit, I mean, they could keep interest rates artificially low forever. The, the Fed would just be, would have to buy up all the bonds on planet Earth issued by the Treasury and then on the official rate, market rate would be whatever they wanted it to be. But what would happen is everybody would get out of the dollar and then you know prices would go up. So I mean, they theoretically they could keep nominal interest rates whatever they wanted. It would just don't even care about that anymore if the Fed were literally the only buyer. I don't. I would like to think it wouldn't get to that point. They would capitulate and just let interest rates rise. But I mean, Bernanke has surprised me before with the crazy stuff he's done. So who knows? Hey, hey, Osborne, can I ask questions before we leave? Uh, quick, I'm supposed to talk about third world sweatshops tomorrow and like why they're good and help those countries get better, but as I'm getting a feel for the audience, uh, I could also do a talk on Somalian anarchy tomorrow. How many of you would rather see Somalian anarchy? Yeah. Can I switch my topic, Osborne? I think. All right, cool. I was wondering if or why with the massive cash injections into the economy recently, uh, I think the, the last audit of the Fed showed like 15 or 16 trillion dollars being lent to foreign and domestic banks. Why is that not causing massive amounts of inflation? And if there is some sort of economic mechanism holding the inflation back, is there any sort of uh, time frame that you would anticipate that you guys are really kicking in? And what would trigger that? Uh, two words, excess reserves. The Fed now pays interest on excess reserves in banks, so they've stuffed a bunch in there, and now banks are in interest on them. All right, let's wrap it up here. Hey, just uh, before we quit here, I want to uh, point out that Bob uh, didn't want to evidently talk about this, but put him on the spot. He teaches online classes through the Mises Institute that you can uh, take at your leisure to uh, learn more about Wall Street economics and uh, whatever else he has to talk about. And I don't know if you want to say a quick word about that. It, it wasn't that I was being humble, I just forgot. Uh, it's, yeah, the, the website is academy.mises.org, and Mises is M-I-S-E-S. -E it's on every other shirt here at Portfest, I forget how to spell it. So, academy.mises.org, and literally next, this coming Monday, I'm teaching a course on the anatomy of the Fed, which is dirtier than it actually is going to be. Uh, and so, if you're interested in this stuff, you might consider looking. Like, there's summer pricing. I think it's like $79. It's a real steal. All right. Thanks all for coming out. Hey, I do have a couple of announcements on how to get out of the way. So. Uh, just a show of hands, how many of you appreciated not having a restroom to use for the last few hours? Uh, that's kind of no one. So there's a problem that we have that I don't really know how to talk about, but I will anyway. Uh, so evidently it's that time of the month for some percentage of our attendees here, and there's a lot of flushing of things that should not be flushed. And that is the cause of the problem that we had this afternoon. So I want you to uh, look around at all uh, the folks that you think might be responsible. Give them a hurry eye and uh, tell them to stop doing that. Other thing, can someone please explain what we're talking about afterwards? I don't know. <laughs> yes, I, you know I should have had Mandrick make this announcement. I think. <laughs> So uh, the other issue we have is uh, if you were squatting on a campsite that's not yours, uh, that's kind of not cool, and you need to move where your shit's going to get jacked. 
Okay, uh, particularly there's a tent site 35 Illinois plates that has just kind of been there for a while. The person who owns that site would like to get on it. So uh, just if you're on someone else's site, get out of there, please. Thank you.